Hi, I'm Tim Prossel. Got a little story for you. It's got to be about five years now since my wife and I moved into this two-floor apartment. Maybe about two or three weeks after the move, my wife came to me and said, Tim, if there's any part of this apartment that feels haunted to you, where would it be? Without missing a beat, I said, the stairwell, this stairwell. My wife paused, leaned forward, and said, yes. For me, it's just feelings. It's, it's, it's got a, some, there's something off about this stairwell. That feeling has faded over the years, but for my wife, she's had more tangible experiences of manifestations. She's heard little snippets of sentences. She's seen things out of the corner of her eye, and it always seems to be centered around this stairwell. Now, I like to do historical research, and just about every state historical society has an online digital historical archive that you can do word searches with and look things up. Oklahoma has one too. So I went there and I started looking for any reports of ghosts in this building. I started looking for articles. Maybe somebody had fallen down the stairs and died or somebody was pushed down the stairs and died. Didn't find anything. At least nothing related to this building. But I did start to find ghost reports, and they'd be presented like any other news article. You'd read about, oh, there's rain coming on Tuesday. The mayor is cracking down on littering. There's a haunted house on Elm Street. Farmer Brown's, wait, wait a second, there's a, <laughs> there's a haunted house on Elm Street? Let me, let me zero in on that and, and find out what that's about. But these ghost reports were presented just as ordinary news, and I started finding more and more of them. Then I went to the Library of Congress, which has a nationwide digital word searchable historical archive of newspapers, and I found more and more ghost reports. When I got to about 100 ghost reports, I knew I had something there. When I got to 200 ghost reports, I gave it a name, the Spectral Edition Project, and I started recording some of these, these articles, and there were a couple of paranormal podcasts that gave me a little bit of space, a featurette, to include in their podcasts. When I got to 300 ghost reports, I knew I had a book. Now, not all 300 are in this book. There's actually about half that, maybe about 150. The best, the weirdest, the scariest, the most confusing, the, the funniest in some cases. They're all in this book, Spectral Edition, Ghost Reports from U.S. Newspapers, 1865, the end of the Civil War, to 1917. That's when the United States entered World War I. This seems to be the time frame when these ghost reports were really just about everywhere. Um, there are a few ghost reports before 1865. There are a few after 1917. But this seems to be the heyday of the ghost report. What you're going to see today is a little bit different for the Spectral Edition Project. I've never done a video before. I've never had guest readers before. And you're going to see three new ghost reports, or hear about three new ghost reports, that aren't in the book. I've come across them in the last few months. I continue to look for these things. And they're all really good stories. So what I'm going to do is go up to my office and introduce my guest readers. Because to tell you the truth, this place is kind of creepy. So I'll see you there. Oh yeah, this feels much more safe. I'm even going to set the mood. Have you ever gotten that feeling that... Never mind. The first guest reader is Nina Zumel. I came across her through her blog called Molto Ghost. 
ghost in parentheses. Molto is a Tagalog word. Tagalog is one of the languages of the Philippines, and it means ghost or apparition or, or spirit. Now, Nina covers all kinds of ghost stories on her blog, including several English language ghost stories. I, I encourage you to check it out. It's really very wonderful. And she's got two other blogs, which strikes me as just exhausting. But I'll give you all the information about all three blogs down in the description of the YouTube video and also at the end of this video. But for now, let's listen to Nina read a very touching and tragic ghost report. A tragic little news article, byline Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, 1915. Sees Wraith of Hubby, ends life. Woman gives rebukes of ghosts as reason for her deed. Always haunted her. After taking poison, widow writes note declaring apparition upbraided her for kind of life she led. Pittsburgh. Fear stricken and remorseful as a result of the nightly visits of what she believed to be the ghost of her dead husband, remonstrating with her for the life she had been leading. A woman listed at the morgue as Mrs. Anna Shaw, aged 33 years, but whose last name is said by her sister to be Rush, took her own life at her home by swallowing a quantity of poisonous disinfectant. After swallowing the poison, the woman is said to have written a letter to her sister telling of her life since the death of her husband in the Dixmont Hospital for the Insane six months ago and warning other women not to follow in her steps. Ghost remonstrated with her. According to other residents of the house where Mrs. Shaw resided with her two children, the woman had been in constant fear for the past several weeks because she said the ghostly figure of her husband confronted her at every turn, both day and night, beckoning her to come, and remonstrating with her because she was not leading a proper life. The woman, after swallowing the poison, lived an hour, in which time she told residents of the house she was sorry for the act and pleaded that a physician be called. The woman's own story, according to the residents of the house, was that she was awakened early in the morning by the figure of her husband. Despondent, she said, because the figure haunted her both day and night, she went to a bathroom and drank the poison. Morned life she led. Following is the note left by the woman. Dear sister, I am sorry for what I have done. The best job I could get paid only $4 a week, and it took that to keep John and Harry in the Sunshine Home. When Ed died, I was left to care for the children, and then I couldn't keep them and myself on the salary I could earn, and I had to do something else. I have seen Ed lately, and he is calling me to him in heaven, and I'm going to meet him there. Forgive me, dear sister, and don't let my boy and girl know of the awful fate of their mother. Let this be a warning to others who might want to lead the life I have led. Your loving sister, Anna. The Ed, referred to in the note, is Mrs. Rush's husband, Edward Rush, a former resident of Washington, Pennsylvania, and an electrician. He died in the Dixmont Hospital, according to Mrs. Marie Laughlin, a sister of the dead woman. And so ends the tragic tale of Anna Rush, a.k.a. Anna Shaw. Rest in peace, dear Anna. Thank you, Nina. I did a little bit of research on what in 1915 was called the Dixmont Hospital for the Insane. And it was uh, built in the 1860s. And this, this place was apparently sprawling because they had their own post office. They had their own train stop. They even had their own cemetery with over a thousand patients buried there. It was finally closed down in the 1980s, and by the 1990s, it became kind of a hot spot for ghost hunters who claim to have seen apparitions and to have recorded spirit voices. It's all torn down now. There's no place that you can go visit except for, except for the, that, that cemetery. I'm sorry. The, I'm, I'm having that feeling again, like there's somebody behind me. Uh, forgive me, I'm, I'm sorry. Our, our next 
guest reader is Patrick Keller. He's the host of the Big Sands podcast. And back when I was doing the audio version of Spectral Edition, the Big Sands podcast was the main place where my featurette was included. I think there were 39 episodes. So if you go to his, his library of previous shows, you might be able to hear some of my Spectral Edition featurettes. Now I know Patrick, he goes to bed fairly early. Um, he might not still be awake, but I'm, I'm hoping. Patrick, are, are you still there? Are you still awake? Hey, Patrick. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh. Uh, I was just sitting here in my jammies uh, reading an article that Tim Prossel sent me. It's a pretty good one. Oh, have we not met? My name's Patrick Keller of the Big Seance Podcast. Hey, why don't we read this article together? Let's do that. It's called Killed by Spectre, Weird Legend of Wisconsin Mining Days. Haunting the old military road at Ridgeway, Wisconsin, an uncanny spirit has caused the violent death of three persons. In the little town of Ridgeway, lying about 20 miles from Madison, Wisconsin, excitement during the past several weeks has been at high pitch. The cause of this agitation is the reappearance of an individual known as the Ridgeway Ghost. For many years, the ghost, at different times, has caused a reign of terror throughout that section of the country. That this apparition has given tangible evidence of its existence is shown by the fact of its having been the cause of three deaths, one of the victims being John Lewis, father of Evan Lewis, one-time champion wrestler of the world. It is a strange, weird tale bearing all the earmarks of a ghost story. Nevertheless, in many incidents, facts bear out the reports in the case. One mile east of Ridgeway, on the old military road, there stood an old deserted farmhouse. For years, a mere shell of boards, so shrunken and hardened by the summer suns that decay and worms never affected it. The house stood until some men at noonday, when the ghost could not walk, tore it down. This was the one-time home of an old miser of the lead mining days named Holbein, who mysteriously disappeared one day, leaving no clue to his fate. Ghostly manifestations were, at intervals, reported as having taken place at the old house, but the lead miners were a hard-headed lot, afraid of neither man nor devil and the stories of lights in the house and moanings at the roadside made little impression. It was not until the mining days were long over that the startling, unexplainable, terrible manifestations of the ghost were made. One night, Dr. Cutler, a Dodgeville physician, was returning from a visit beyond Ridgeway, which is six miles from Dodgeville. He was suddenly affrighted to see a dark figure sitting on the buggy tongue between his horses. The reins slipped from his nerveless grasp, and the horses dashed away at full speed, the specter riding the pole, nothing discommoded by the shaking he was getting. Down a hill, up another, dashed the frantic horses, and lo, the specter vanished. The doctor's story of the occurrence met with little credence. He was known to be one who loved the flowing bowl. He had taken a drop too many, said his scoffing friends. It was a dream, a specter of delirium tremens, of mania apotu. I have no clue what that is. But the doctor declared that he was sober. He recalled the fact that a year previous... When he really was a little full, while passing the self-same haunted spot, he had become aware of a dark and silent stranger sitting beside him in his carriage. For a mile, the stranger rode, saying never a word, and all at once he was gone. All the time, 
The doctor had asked no questions of his drunken wits and had considered this nothing more than a strange experience. He was now convinced that the man beside him on the seat and the thing on the pole were not of this world. Whereat the people laughed in the daytime, but not long afterward, the reputation of the doctor received a sudden and terrible vindication as he was himself to later vindicate it almost as terribly. John Lewis, father of Evan Lewis, champion wrestler of the United States, known in the world of sports everywhere, was a prosperous and respected farmer living in the vicinity of Ridgeway, a man of sober life, of undaunted courage, and blessed with the tremendous physical strength his son has inherited. Sixteen years ago last fall, he was returning home after nightfall, having spent the day assisting a friend in butchering. The night was not dark, and when he drew near the haunted spot, he determined to cut across lots to reach his home. He was approaching the stone wall at the roadside to climb it, when his attention was arrested by the sight of a figure that seemed to have gathered itself together out of the just now tenantless air and stood confronting him in a menacing attitude. He knew of no enemy, and highwaymen were unknown in that retired quarter of the state. He decided that it must be someone trying to frighten him. So he hailed the figure, and no response being made, he advanced upon it. The figure did not budge, but stood a towering shape of blackness, a gigantic and grisly thing. Some unaccountable awe and the uncanny hugeness or the thing made Lewis decide to avoid a conflict, and drawing his butcher knife from his pocket, he started to pass by when the figure, raising an arm with a forbidding gesture, stepped athwart his path. Obeying a hasty impulse that was more of a ghastly and soul-chilling terror than it was anger, Lewis let drive his keen knife, only to find himself piercing the empty air. In the morning, a neighbor found Lewis lying inside the stone wall in a semi-conscious condition. Of what happened after he had struck with the knife, he had but vague impressions. He said he had been hurled in the air as if in the vortex of a cyclone, pounded, beaten, crushed into insensibility. Beyond the awful pain and the awful fear, he remembered nothing with distinctness. He died a few hours after he had been carried home, his neighbors having it that his heart had been literally torn to pieces with the shock. Whether it was the shock of flight, whether it was his physical injuries that killed him, none is ready to say with certainty. As he lay dying, he asserted his belief that his death was occasioned by a supernatural being. Thus did the death of John Lewis make the first indication of the reputation of Dr. Cutler of Dodgeville and the scoffing seized. But a second time, and a third, was the doctor to be vindicated. Returning home one night, a dressmaker encountered the ghost and being pursued by it, soon after died of the shock occasioned by the intense flight. At last, Dr. Cutler himself finally and triumphantly vindicated his word though at the cost of his own life, for dying as a result of fright, he became the third of the victims of the implicable specter of the old military road. And now the mysterious apparition has again made its appearance, and the good people of Ridgeway await, with much anxiety, the result. Thank you, Patrick. 
I'll give you more information on how you can find the Big Seance Podcast at the end of this video and down in the description section on YouTube. Now, it wouldn't be a proper episode of Spectral Edition if I didn't get to read a ghost report myself. This is an interesting one, and according to the writer, it takes place in Hopewell, New York. I looked at a map. There is a Hopewell, New York. It's way in the west, upstate near the Finger Lakes region. But it also mentions that a boy from the town of Fishkill wanders by. Fishkill is way on the other side of the state, and near Fishkill is a town called Hopewell Junction. So I'm pretty sure that we're talking about Hopewell Junction. Fishkill and Hopewell Junction are both in the Hudson Valley, and they're just upriver from Sleepy Hollow. Now, I mention this because this ghost report feels more like a folk legend than, than a newspaper article. And there are similarities between this story and Washington Irving's The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. There isn't a headless horseman, but just you wait and see. I recorded this earlier today during daylight because I have ghosts in my stairwell and I'm pretty sure a couple of minutes ago I heard something tapping on this window. Ghost of Haunted Tavern. Landlord appears on scene of former murders. Farmer folk living near the old Hageman homestead just outside of Hopewell, New York, have been much mystified and alarmed of late by strange sights which are wholly unexplainable. This place has long been known as the Haunted Tavern, and the old-timers say that the spirits are breaking loose in it again. The building has been deserted for several years. The last person to live in it was the daughter of an old resident named Stockholm. Since she died, no one has expressed a desire to rent the place. This is due to the many queer things that have happened in the tavern. During a stormy night a few days ago, Wilbur Thompson, a farmer, was passing the place when he heard uncanny sounds proceeding from the old building, weird shrieks followed by loud poundings which came from the tumble-down structure caused Thompson to ride at full speed into Hopewell and tell of his terrifying experience. On a moonlight night recently, a fish kill boy who was passing the house declares he saw a white figure pacing backward and forward on the front porch. He paused to make sure that his eyes were not deceiving him, but as he did so, he says, the figure began waving a pair of arms that reached down almost to its feet. Then the lad fled. Those who have followed the history of the tavern closely say that the spirit of old Henrik Hageman is again stalking about. He is reported to have been seen at rare intervals during the last century. According to the traditions here, its appearance always portends some calamity. Several years ago, it was seen just a few days before a violent storm, which destroyed the crops and in which three people were killed by lightning. Henrik Hageman built the tavern long years prior to the American Revolution. His place had a bad name from the start. It was reported that several persons known to have had considerable money had put up at the tavern for the night and had never been heard from again. Then followed stories that the place was haunted. This was while Hageman was alive. According to the traditions, he finally died in terrible agony. He was taken sick under mysterious circumstances, and then, from no apparent cause, his throat began swelling until he could not breathe. Thus, he died by strangulation. After he had passed away, one solitary spirit was all that was ever seen in the tavern. Down through half a dozen decades, this wraith is said to have held sway in the primitive building. Sometimes it would disappear for 10 years or more, and recently it had lengthened its visitations to 15 and 20 years. But when it came back, there was always horror in Hopewell, and if anyone happened to be living in the tavern, it would immediately become vacated. The story that is told of Hageman's career is one of the most uncanny traditions in that part of the state. It has been handed down from generation to generation and has probably, in its long stretch through time, been exaggerated. 
People said openly that there were secret rooms in the tavern into which no one was allowed to enter. If a lone traveler came there at night who was not acquainted in the region, Hageman would put him to lodge in one of these secret rooms, and the man never appeared again. It was currently reported that there had been a score of persons foully dealt with in Hageman's house, and that the restless spirits of the murdered ones made the nights hideous by their groans and screams. Before dispatching his victim, it was said Hageman would chain them to the wall and choke them until life was extinct. These groans were never heard anywhere except in the upper part of the old house as long as Hageman lived, but after his death, his spirit was, was said to haunt all parts of the house and even to appear out of doors. Some told of seeing Hageman mount his horse and ride up and down the roads in the vicinity. Others insisted that his spirit, mounted on the horse, had been seen repeatedly to enter and emerge from the ruins of the old dirt cellar that was used as a stable when Hageman first built the house. Hageman had come to his death at a ripe old age and from no apparent disease. For a year he had complained of great suffering in his throat, but no physician could find anything the matter with it or him. He said he had a continual choking and would gasp, get purple in the face, and would be on the verge of choking to death. He lingered in this way for many months and finally died gasping for breath. It was generally believed at the time that he was a victim of special judgment. Well, my wife really likes this apartment, so what are you going to do? What I'm going to do is thank Nina Zumel and Patrick Keller, and especially thank you for watching this unusual episode of Spectral Edition. Have yourselves a great night. Why do you keep staring at me? You don't even have eyes.